Have you ever put down a book and wondered, what in the world did that mean? Chances are, the author didn't have a clearly defined theme worked out or didn't execute it well. A literary theme is the unifying or dominant idea in a work of fiction. This is not to be confused with the plot. The theme is the main topic or central idea. This can be as simple as love, family, or revenge. It can be as complicated as science versus nature, the folly of youth, or the treachery of commerce. Every writer makes his or her writing about something, and that something, the essence of the story, is the theme. For example, a major theme in Great Expectations is that moral values are more important than wealth and status. Alienation is a primary theme in crime and punishment, while true love triumphs, dominates the well-loved classic Princess Bride. What good does it do to know major themes? We've already pointed out how a story without a uniting theme is often confusing and leaves the reader wanting more. Well, learning about themes isn't just a way to better analyze an author's finished work of fiction. It's also a way to improve your own writing. The stronger a writer's theme is, and the more in tune the writer is with that theme's execution, the better the work as a whole will be. For your own written work, ask yourself, what under all the characters and subplots is my story really about? Is it about love conquering all? About good triumphing over evil? about the dangers of progress. Often, your story will have a spine. This is a one-sentence description of the heart behind your book. For example, one could say the spine of Pride and Prejudice is a man and woman during the Regency era overcome their preconceptions to ultimately find love. While two major themes are matrimony and, you guessed it, prejudice. This might sound too simple, but that's okay. The theme is supposed to be an oversimplification of the story's meaning. Once you've defined your theme in the spine of your story, it's helpful to look at all your characters, situations, and plot developments through this lens. Say your theme is love fails in the end. Even at the happiest moments of your love story, it might be wise to include some foreshadowing of love's imminent doom. This helps enrich your writing. Two of the primary ways to build a theme in writing are through motifs and symbols. A motif is a reoccurring literary structure that helps develop your theme. It's a meaningful pattern that reuses objects, characters, even weather, to further emphasize the theme. For example, in The Great Gatsby, changing weather patterns reflect the shifting tone of the story. The weather is overwhelmingly hot when characters feel suffocated by a situation. Tension is connected to storms, and the day of Gatsby's funeral, it's pouring rain. A symbol is like a motif, but on a smaller scale. It's an image, character, or object that has a meaning beneath the immediate surface. Let's stick with the great Gatsby in our explanation. In the novel, Gatsby is still in love with a former flame, Daisy. He's come up in the world since their last meeting and now lives across the lake from her in an enormous mansion. Daisy has a green light on the edge of her dock, and Gatsby watches that light from the edge of his own dock. This is an example of symbolism. There's nothing to suggest Gatsby is particularly infatuated with green lights, but for him, the light symbolizes Daisy, who seems to him unattainable. In summary, a literary theme is different than a plot. While a plot is the order of events in a work of fiction, the theme involves the overall meaning and purpose of the book. The theme is where fiction intersects with life. It may be a story about hobbits in Middle Earth, but the theme of friendship and good conquering evil is still applicable to real life.
Do you have hair that flows like a waterfall? Or a hair that is as curly as a corkscrew? Are your eyes as blue as the ocean? Or are your eyes brown like chocolate? These descriptions are all similes. Similes that may describe you. But what are similes exactly? And how are they used? Similes are a type of figurative language. Figurative language uses figures of speech to make written and verbal communication more effective, easier to understand, and more striking. Similes are a specific type of figurative language called imagery. There are several different types of imagery, but we'll stick with similes for this video. Similes use the words like or as to compare two unalike things. This comparison helps to bring out different qualities in the words, helping the audience to see the words in new ways. Some examples of similes used in everyday speech are, he is as strong as an ox, she can swim like a fish. The first simile uses the word as to compare a man to an ox. By comparing a man to an ox, you get the full impact of his strength. It would otherwise be flat and boring if you just said he was very strong. The second simile uses the word like to compare a woman to a fish. By doing this, you get a picture of how well she swims that a simple she's a good swimmer would not quite convey. Similes do not have to compare people to animals. There are many similes that compare a person to an object, or even one object to another. The clean tablecloth was as white as snow. The new car drove like a dream. As you can see, these items are not people or animals, but instead objects. However, these similes still use the word like or as to compare two unalike items. Having the word as appear twice in a simile can be confusing. It can be hard to tell what is being compared. Just remember to look for the noun in the sentence, what or who is being described. Comparing the tablecloth's color to snow helps the audience to see how white and clean it really is. Similes that use the word like are a bit easier. Driving the car is a positive experience, like a good dream. That comparison can evoke thoughts of a smooth ride, a fast drive, or even the wind blowing in your hair as you cruise along the beach. Such a simple simile can bring together so many new ideas. Similes are not just used in speech, however. Songs often use similes as well to make comparisons and draw attention to images and ideas, like the song Flying Trapeze by Alfred Lee and George Laybourne. Once I was happy, but now I'm forlorn, like an old coat that is tattered and torn. The writer of this song used the word like to compare being forlorn to an old coat. As silly as the song is, the image of the tattered and torn coat really helps to bring the depression of the singer to life. Without similes, many songs would seem lifeless and dull. Similes are also often used in poetry. In the poem, A Red, Red Rose, Robert Burns uses a simile to describe his love. Oh, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. My love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. By comparing his love to both a rose, which is a symbol of love in many cultures, and also to a sweet melody, you get much more out of the poem than just love. The rose gives you color, red, the sweet scent of a rose, the soft velvetiness of its petals, and maybe even the sting of the rose's thorns. Like a rose, love can be complex and much more than just pretty. Melodies in music also have connotations of their own. Played in tune gives you an indication that things are going smoothly. Novels also use similes to bring characters and settings to life. An example of this occurs in Jane Austen's book, Pride and Prejudice. The main love interest, Darcy, says, I have been used to consider poetry as the food of love. By comparing poetry to food, you can see the importance he places on it. 
it is much more impactful to the reader than the character just stating that he finds poetry important in romance. This also helps to give us insight into his personality, making him a deeper, more well-rounded character. As you can see, similes help to make language more colorful and easier to understand. Similes help bring new color and life into mundane objects. They are an important part of songs, poetry, and even everyday speech. What similes do you use in your day-to-day -day speech? Or how can you spot similes in the things that you read or listen to? All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Shakespeare's words have a ring of truth, even though they might not be literally true. Metaphors like this one help bring ideas to life. But what is a metaphor? Metaphors are a type of figurative language. Figurative language uses figures of speech to make written and verbal communication more effective, easier to understand, and more striking. Metaphors are a specific type of figurative language called imagery. There are seven types of imagery in figurative language. Similes, metaphors, and allusions use non-literal comparisons that illuminate ideas. Personification uses a non-literal comparison exclusively to a person, as in the leaf danced across the lawn. Alliteration, assonance, and onomatopoeia use sounds to create different feelings in the audience than the literal words would normally convey. Getting back to our specific topic, Topic, metaphors are words or phrases that compare two things. Unlike a simile, they do not use the words like or as to compare the words. Instead, they state that one thing is another thing. Like in the quote from Shakespeare, the world is a stage. Metaphors are used in literature, movies, plays, and even in day-to-day -day speech. You might even find yourself using metaphors without realizing it. Some commonly used metaphors include, love is a battlefield, there's a blanket of clouds, time is a thief, he's a night owl. All these examples compare two things directly. Love is compared to a battle, clouds are compared to blankets, time is compared to a thief, and man is compared to an owl. Of course, we know that a man is not literally an owl, but the comparison helps us to visualize things in a much more vibrant way. How boring would it be to say he likes to stay up late at night on a consistent basis? Other types of metaphors use indirect comparisons. A couple of examples include work has dried up. Their ideas are difficult to swallow. In these metaphors, you have two steps in the comparison. In the first example, work is not being compared to dried up, but rather to something that can be dried up. You can use your imagination to fill in the comparison. Maybe an empty swimming pool or a dry desert oasis. Similarly, ideas are not being swallowed. Ideas are being compared to something that you eat that is hard to swallow. Maybe a dry cracker or a peanut butter sandwich. This type of indirect comparison allows someone to fill in an image with personal experiences. Maybe you've never been to a desert, but you have gone through a hot, dry summer. Maybe you've never eaten a peanut butter sandwich, but you have had to swallow a big pill. Making images personal helps draw you into the story and makes it that much more visceral. Here are some examples of metaphors outside of everyday speech. In the poem, The Tiger by William Blake, he expounds on the beauty and danger of the wild tiger. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? The first line of the poem says the tiger is burning bright. Of course, the tiger is not literally on fire, but this comparison is used as a metaphor to illustrate the tiger's bright color and even the tiger's dangerous nature. Like getting burned by a fire, the tiger can be a dangerous beast. In the novel A Little Princess, the author Frances Hodgson Burnett wrote, She looked as if she had never had quite enough to eat. 
Her very eyes were hungry. As you can see, metaphors help make language more colorful and easier to understand by bringing new color and life into common objects and ideas. Hi, and welcome to this video about predictive reading. Today, we'll explain what predictive reading is, the importance of predictive reading, and walk you through some easy examples that will give you better insight into this strategy. So, what is predictive reading? Predictive reading is exactly what it sounds like. Readers use their own experiences and understanding of what they're currently reading to predict what comes next. Let's break that down a little further. Readers use everything they read to help make their predictions. Everything means titles, pictures, written word, and diagrams. For example, let's say you're reading about the price of milk. You remember reading in the past that the price of milk has increased, but your current reading notes that it continues to cost more and more to produce a gallon of milk. You can reasonably predict that the price of milk will continue increasing. By carefully reading and analyzing content, the reader can predict what's about to happen. Why is predictive reading important? Predictive reading helps readers improve a number of skills they'll find useful in all walks of life. Let's take a look at some of them. Predictive reading helps with focus. To understand what you're reading, you have to focus on each word and piece of punctuation. You can't skim. You not only have to understand what you're reading, but connect current reading to what you've learned in the past. Predictive reading helps with that recall. You have to remember what you've previously read and use that information to help inform your predictions. Predictive reading helps you think ahead and anticipate. You focused on the reading and you understand it. You use recall to remember pieces of information. Now it's time to think ahead and anticipate what comes next. Comprehension and recall mean you have the tools to make a reasonable prediction and anticipate what happens next. Predictive reading also helps with revision strategies. Maybe your prediction wasn't correct. Using the milk example, let's say you predicted milk prices would drop, but they did in fact increase. You can review what you've read, reevaluate how you came to your conclusion, and revise it. Those are just a few of the benefits of predictive reading. Now, let's examine some of the clues you can look for when making reading predictions. There are a number of aspects of writing that provide clues to help you make reasonable reading predictions. For example, a book's title provides clues. You know Harry Potter books will be about Harry Potter just by reading the title, so that's an easy one. The book's cover art might also provide clues when the title doesn't. Let's take James Bradley, Flags of Our Fathers. At first glance, that title may not give a clue, but one look at the photo tells you what the book is about. It's the iconic photo of six men pushing an American flag up a hill in war, so you know it's about Iwo Jima in World War II. The table of contents can also provide clues based on the names of a chapter. Prologues can foreshadow information. Illustrations can provide clues based on what they show. So here's a predictive reading example and how you can use all of the information we've talked about to make a prediction. Here's the title of a book, When We Lost Our Innocence. The book cover contains one photo each of former President John F. Kennedy, civil rights icon Martin Luther King, and former U.S. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. From looking at the clues in the title and the cover photo, what predictions could you make? There could be several. All three men were assassinated between 1963 and 1968. So you could predict the book will be about how the deaths of these leaders sent America into a spiral of chaos and despair. The 1960s was also a time when the country became ensnared in an unpopular Vietnam War 
and African Americans were fighting for their civil rights. You could predict the book examines how the deaths of these three men left a leadership void at a time the country needed it most. Now that you've formed a preliminary prediction, you start reading the book. You use recall to refer to information you've read, and if you see your prediction was incorrect, you revise it based on new knowledge. As you could probably guess, detective novels are one of the most famous methods of predictive reading. There's always a detective trying to solve a crime. There are clues throughout the book that can help you determine the identity of the bad guy. With these novels, you really have to focus because the bad guy is rarely the person you think it is. That's predictive reading, the process of taking information and predicting what's to come. The predicting part is always fun, but the ability to focus, recall information, think ahead, and revise are all valuable skills. Welcome to this video about textual evidence. Textual evidence deals with facts in writing and the strategies used to figure out whether or not the information is factual. Textual evidence comes into play when an author presents a position or thesis and uses evidence to support the claims. That evidence can come in a number of different forms. We'll explain textual evidence and the best way to analyze it. So let's start here. What is textual evidence? Textual evidence uses information from an originating source or other text to support an argument. Think of textual evidence as the driving force behind debates. Debates take a position and then use facts as supporting evidence. You can take any debate position you want, but without facts to back up your argument, you can't prove your point. Here's an important issue. Evidence is not the same thing as a claim. Evidence is a single fact or set of facts. Barack Obama was the 44th president of the United States is a fact. A claim is a statement that can be in dispute and requires further evidence. Aliens are buried at Area 51 in Nevada is a claim that can't be verified. Textual evidence only uses facts to make its point. So what should you look for when evaluating textual evidence? Think PDF. No, not the file format used in presentations. You want to make sure the information is precise, descriptive, and factual. That's easy to remember. Here are some clues to look for when analyzing textual evidence. Look for data that also includes the source information. Data are the strongest available pieces of evidence because statistics use analysis to reach strong, accurate conclusions. Here's an example of statistics. Which one of the examples is factual? One, Americans with a college degree earn more money than Americans who have only earned a high school diploma, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Two, about 327 million people live in the United States, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Three, Nearly half of American households own dogs, according to a national survey. The answer? Those are all factual statements. You can go to the source and examine the data yourself. That's why statistics are such a powerful tool in textual evidence. The next form of evidence isn't as powerful as statistics, but it's often used to examine textual evidence. Experts give testimony in a number of areas. Testimony doesn't just mean in the legal sense, like when someone takes a stand in a court case. Testimony also means providing a set of facts based on expertise. An experienced and trained car mechanic can provide testimony on the workings of a car engine. A doctor with years of specialized training can testify about treatment options for patients. A pilot with Thousands of hours of flight time can testify about the control panel on a jumbo jet. They all have expertise backed by verifiable, factual information. Authors use testimonial information to make their argument in an attempt to sway their audience. 
Statistics and expert testimony are the most reliable ways to analyze textual evidence, but there are two other methods as well. Anecdotal evidence can be tricky since anecdotes are personal observations that may or may not be factual. You can embellish anecdotes for literary effect. For example, you can tell an anecdote about the end of your day and it goes like this. After a long day, I'd come home with a headache. My body hurt, I was so tired that I didn't wanna eat. I don't know if this makes any sense, but I was so tired I couldn't sleep. Maybe that's because I had so much on my mind. From there, the author might ask, have you ever been unhappy at work? The author would list the medical symptoms that correlate with unhappiness at work and then provide statistics on the number of Americans unhappy at their job. The anecdote on its own isn't really sufficient to persuade the audience, but anecdotes can serve a valuable literary purpose by keeping the audience engaged and leading them to the facts. An analogy compares two different things. My house is as hot as the sun is an example of an analogy, but in textual evidence, analogies prove useful when there's little available research on a specific topic. Cutting edge topics have little data because researchers are in the beginning stages of gathering information. Here are two examples of analogical evidence. Based on how the audience uses mobile phones, we believe this is the right screen size for tablet computers. I saw a boring film that has a similar plot to this movie, so therefore the movie must be boring. In analogical evidence, the author tries to show a parallel, but you can see the problems, especially in the movie analogy. Just because one film is boring doesn't mean a similar movie will also be. That's why analogical evidence is the weakest form of evidence. So that's our look at textual evidence, the process of finding facts to support an argument. We reviewed statistics and testimony, the two most reliable ways of analyzing textual evidence. We reviewed anecdotal and analogical evidence, two useful but weaker methods of providing facts. Let's talk about supporting details and how they can help strengthen your writing. A paragraph usually starts with the main idea, also called the topic sentence, and the rest of the paragraph gives specific details to support and develop that point. Today, we'll be talking about those details called supporting details. Think of it this way. If you're building a table, then you need a flat surface for the tabletop. This is like your main point or topic sentence. If that flat surface doesn't have any legs to stand on though, it's no good as a table. The supporting details are like the legs of the table, propping up the topic sentence. There are six main types of supporting details. Descriptions, vocabulary, proof, voices, explanation, and importance. Description is fairly self-explanatory. The writer can use the five senses, comparison, and metaphors to help paint a vivid picture for the reader. Vocabulary helps with clarification. For example, if you have a topic sentence that relies on the word pulchritudinous, it might help to include a definition of the word so the reader doesn't get sidetracked. Pulchritudinous means beautiful, by the way. Proof is often made up of facts, statistics, and dates that are hard evidence for your main point, and voices are expert quotes, individual opinions, or different perspectives that can be considered soft proof. Explanation is restating the main point more simply, and importance is answering the question, so what, after a fact or a quote. Let's take a look at a quick example. Being a celebrity is often difficult. First of all, celebrities have to look flawless all the time. Perez Hilton once said celebrities have to sacrifice their private lives when they choose to enter the spotlight. Think about the gossip rags you've seen with unflattering paparazzi photos of the private moments of the star's lives. This obsession can sometimes lead to stalking, threatening letters, and even physical attacks. Okay, so our main point is that first sentence. Being a celebrity is difficult. The supporting details follow. 
you can see a voice is presented, that of Perez Hilton, a descriptive explanation directing you to think about the paparazzi photos and two simply descriptive phrases. This paragraph would be even stronger with a testimonial about a real-life story of a celebrity facing danger because of their place in the public image. That would be a proof-based supporting detail. When you're writing supporting details, it's important not to stray too far from your original point. Remember, every paragraph in a written work is pointing back in some way to your overall thesis, and every sentence in the paragraph is pointing to the main point of that paragraph. If you have a main point about, say, how dogs are man's best friend, you wouldn't want to use an example of how disloyal cats are in that paragraph. Save that point for another paragraph. Stay focused on facts about dogs in the supporting paragraph about dogs. If you get off track from your main point, your reader might get confused and lose interest. A common mistake in writing a paper is not providing enough specific details. The more specific, the better. A vague detail is like a thin table leg. It will make your entire point wobbly. Often, vague details come when you're pressed for time or don't want to research a topic fully. Take the time to make your paper worth reading. Let's look at an example to further prove this point. You could write something like this. I felt like I was sick. By the time I got home, it was worse. The symptoms kept developing, one after the other. Okay, you know in general what's happening, but think how much more convincing the following sentence would be. I was sick at my desk when I felt the tickle in my throat and started to cough. By the time I got home, the room seemed to be swimming around me and I found I had a fever of 102. I crawled into bed, shivering. That's a little more vivid, isn't it? The details are strong and vibrant, not generic and vague. It makes the writer's point much more clearly. So let's look back on what we've learned. Supporting details help hold up your main point. They should be specific, creative, and focused on the main point of the paragraph. Do this and your writing will greatly improve. Let's talk about inferences in reading and writing. An inference is a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. First, we'll talk about how this can help improve your reading skills. Then we'll talk about how you can apply it to your own writing. If you're making an inference while reading, you're making a guess about what you don't know based on the information available. Basically, you're reading between the lines. You can use your prior knowledge and textual information to draw conclusions, make critical judgments, and form interpretations of the text. Inferences can occur in the form of conclusions, predictions, or new ideas. The easiest way to show this is with an example. Let's say I arrived at school but couldn't find my lesson plan. I knew I was reading it over breakfast, so I make the assumption that I left it on the kitchen table. This is an inference. I don't know for sure where I left it, but I'm making an inference based on the fact that I know I was working on it at home. You make inferences every day. Maybe you're able to finish your friend's sentence because of the information they've already given you. Maybe you predict the ending of a movie before it comes. Maybe you can tell what singer is on the radio based on the sound of their voice and the topic of their song. All of these are things you've discovered based on surrounding facts, not actual knowledge. All of these are inferences. Reading is an active, reflective, problem-solving process. You don't just want to read words. You also want to understand the deeper ideas the author is trying to communicate. When you're reading, it's helpful to look for patterns or relationships in the text that might shed greater light on the subject. Let's look at Harper Lee's classic To Kill a Mockingbird for an example of this. Remember, it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. That was the only time I ever heard Atticus say it was a sin to do something, and I asked Miss Maudie about it. Your father's right, she said. Mockingbirds don't do one thing but make music for us to enjoy. That's why it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. This inference helps us draw a connection between the mockingbird and Boo Radley. The mockingbird is innocent and does nothing but make music. This is a symbol for the innocence of Boo and highlights the thematic heart of the novel. Those who have the power must protect the vulnerable. It's a beautiful inference, but you'll note it is never stated directly in the novel. It's a gem left to be discovered by the reader. Inferences can help with smaller practical reading comprehension problems too. 
Sometimes, if you don't understand what a word means, you can infer its meaning from what's around it in the sentence. Take, for example, the following sentence. She was gregarious, found always at one party or another, around town, surrounded by laughing people. Her door was always open. Even if you didn't have a dictionary to tell you that gregarious means a person who enjoys social gatherings and is fond of company, you could glean as much from the description of the subject as someone who liked parties and whose door was always open. Now, let's talk about how you can work inferences into your own writing. Try this. Practice writing a paragraph describing something you're familiar with — your cat, a movie, a pineapple pizza — without explicitly stating what it is. Then see if your friend can figure out what you're talking about without being told. If they can, they are making an inference. You'll probably note that your writing is much more creative and engaging than it would have been if you simply stated what it was you were talking about. You have to work hard to describe the things you're familiar with in new words and phrases, and that makes your writing more interesting. Take a look at this example. Half a dozen students huddled at the end of the street. It was 7 a.m., just moments before the bus was supposed to arrive, and the street lights spilled around them in a pool of light. They shuffled back and forth to keep warm, rubbing their hands together and stamping their feet against the frozen pavement. If I were to ask you what season is described in this piece of writing, you'd probably say winter right away. We talked about cold temperatures and frozen pavement. Plus, it's still dark at 7 in the morning, which is distinctly a winter characteristic. You can see how writing for inference in this case was more imaginative and effective than simply saying, students waited in the cold winter for the bus. To sum up, Understanding inference can enrich your reading by helping you read between the lines for the author's intent. It can also enrich your writing by helping you paint vivid pictures without stating the facts directly. When reading a piece of literature, especially if it's lengthy, it can be difficult to pinpoint the main ideas and events that took place. Summarizing text is a useful tool for not only recalling lengthy text, but also for organizing the text's main ideas. In this video, we'll look at how to write a summary and what a summary should include. A good summary is a brief recollection of the main point of the piece. The summary should include main characters, events and places, the overall purpose of the piece of writing, and, most importantly, it should be shorter than the original text. Summaries should not include supporting details that aren't important to the text's main point or plot. So, how do we identify what ideas to include and what to leave out? First, it's important to review the text. If you're going to write a summary, don't just skim through the text or just read a chapter here and there. Reading through the entire text at length helps you to have a clear understanding of the piece. If the piece has chapter names or subheadings, these can help you organize the main ideas that are mentioned in those sections. The next thing you'll want to do is identify the main ideas, characters, or events. Pinpointing any narrative arcs or sequential events can help abbreviate the major points of the text. Who are the subjects of the story? What is happening to them and where did it happen? Was there an exchange of ideas in the text? If so, did the text explain or give examples to support the idea? All these questions are important to keep in mind when you begin summarizing. Once you have answers to these questions, you'll need to go through and choose what is most important. Which details move the story further or convey the main idea best? Pick these points and include them when writing your final summary. As you begin to write, remember to use your own words. Make sure your recollection is accurate but not verbatim of the original text. Whether you're summarizing a story or a research paper, it's important to write chronologically so the important events in the story are in the correct order. Jumbling the order of events will make your summary confusing and hard to follow. Lastly, it's important to be objective. Not all literature is unbiased. However, it is still your job in a summary to retell events or ideas that do not convey your personal opinions, unless explicitly asked. That means avoiding adjectives or other words that describe events negatively or positively unless you are quoting the original author or a character in the text you're summarizing. When summarizing the opinion of others, make sure to state whose opinion it is. Hi, and welcome to this video on primary and secondary sources. Determining the difference between primary and secondary sources can be difficult. In essence, primary sources are objects, usually written works, created during a specific time that relate to the specific time or topic that you're studying. A novel or an autobiography would be examples of this. Secondary sources, on the other hand, are texts that analyze, interpret, or comment on primary sources. However, this is only a quick definition of primary sources. As you will see later in the video, 
what is considered a primary or secondary source can shift depending on context. First, let's define primary and secondary sources more fully and look at some examples before taking a look at how to find them. As previously suggested, primary sources are sources that were created during a specific time and discuss that specific time or topic during that time, and secondary sources comment in some way on these sources. In many cases, secondary sources are meant to be persuasive. Before going too far, let's look at a list of sources considered primary and secondary. Primary sources include creative works, such as poems, novels, and plays, diaries and correspondence, original documents, like birth certificates, autobiographies, manuscripts, speeches, constitutions and laws, government documents, or a journal article with new findings. Secondary sources include criticisms of art, whether it be literature, film, music, or what have you, journal articles containing analysis or commentary, textbooks, encyclopedias, interpretive or analytical books, or political commentary. Keep in mind that these lists are only partial. Also, there's a good chance that the sources you'll be focusing on in your studies are literary or historical. For instance, it is quite common to be assigned essays about literary works, poems or novels, for example, in which you have to use secondary sources, usually scholarly journal articles, to support your claims about the literary work in question. Things can start to get a little more complicated here. Sometimes primary sources can be considered secondary sources and some secondary sources can be read as primary sources. It all depends on the context and purpose for which a source is being used. For example, an ancient encyclopedia might be studied as a primary source if it is being analyzed and interpreted in order to learn about the era of its publication. However, encyclopedias usually are considered secondary sources. Don't worry about this too much though. The primary secondary source distinction is useful about 99% of the time. Just try to keep in mind that not every source can be pigeonholed into just one category. Now that we know what our sources are, let's look at how you go about finding them in the first place. Finding sources is often a hassle. It can be anxiety producing and many students simply do not know where to begin their search. The best place to begin looking is the library. However, in this instance, the library can mean two things. It could mean the actual brick and mortar building, or it could mean an online database. The second option is much more user-friendly for citizens of the 21st century and can be accessed through your library's website. If you're attending a university, then try to access the online database through your school's library homepage. Many public libraries and secondary school libraries also offer this option. Search terms will vary between websites, so it's important to experiment with search criteria. For instance, you may find a search filter that allows you to search for only primary sources. As for secondary sources, consider using databases that are commonly subscribed to by educational institutions, EBSCO, JSTOR, and ProQuest, to name a few. There are countless other databases with different specializations ranging from literature to law. Consider searching through the different databases related to your subject in order to find a useful database for you. Ultimately, databases are full of useful secondary sources. If you're unable to access these types of databases, another option for pursuing secondary sources is Google Scholar. Google Scholar is essentially a free-to-use online database of scholarly sources. Though many sources are trapped behind a paywall, this option also provides many free-to-read sources. If you prefer a non-internet approach, consider strolling through the library for books on your chosen topic. And of course, when in need, ask a librarian for help. They are experts at determining primary and secondary sources and will be more than willing to point you in the right direction. Now, let's take a look at some helpful tips to remember as you start putting together your sources. Aim to use credible sources. In terms of secondary sources, Articles published in scholarly journals and scholarly books work best and are considered the most reliable. This is due to the fact that they have been peer-reviewed by experts in the field before publication. Personal blogs and Wikipedia are usually not considered credible sources. Remember, anyone can post whatever they like on personal blogs. Wikipedia is open to be edited by anyone, so it also often lacks credibility. 
It's also a good idea to ask your teacher or professor about what they accept as primary and secondary sources. Instructors have different ideas for what they consider a credible source. When in doubt, ask for clarification. Remember that not all sources are equal. Certain sources, like newspaper editorials or brief news stories about a topic, do not hold as much credibility as scholarly articles and books. First, editorial pieces in newspapers or on websites are often biased and go through little peer review or vetting before publication. Writers of such pieces often have a political axe to grind on or, perhaps worse, are themselves misinformed about the topic. Newspaper articles, though useful in some cases, usually offer only a very shallow reading of an event or topic, which doesn't allow you to get all of the necessary information. Aim for sources closest to the original. What does this mean? Simply put, if you want to discuss a particular writer's work, whether it be primary or secondary source, try to find the original source. For example, instead of using a summary from Wikipedia or Cliff Notes, aim to familiarize yourself with a primary source. This is important because sources that summarize other sources are removed from the source itself. You never know when a bias can enter the equation or, even worse, false information. If you find a particularly interesting argument used in a secondary source, aim to find where that argument was originally published. Many scholarly sources rely on arguments from previous secondary sources. Therefore, Johnny Smith may use an argument initially created by Jane Johnson in an article he's written. Instead of relying on Johnny Smith's interpretation or summary of Jane Johnson's work, try to go back and find Jane Johnson's original source. This is important because it is possible that Johnny Smith is himself misreading or editorializing Jane Johnson's argument. Therefore, reading the original source prevents the possibility of interpretational bias. In the end, the further away from the original source you go, the higher the chances that the meaning of the original has been twisted or misinterpreted, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Lastly, who is the publisher? Anyone with enough money can start a publishing house. However, certain publishers have more credibility than others. In particular, look for works published by university presses. Though these are not the only credible sources, they are usually a safe bet. When in doubt, consider searching for the publisher's website online in order to get a feel for its credibility. Finally, before we go, let's look at a review question. Which of the following is not a primary source? A. A novel. B. A textbook. C. A diary. Or D. A speech. Correct answer is B. A textbook. A textbook is a secondary source because it is expounding upon or commenting on other sources. Have you ever heard someone say of their car, she's a beauty, or refer to the winter wind as harsh or unkind? If you have, you've probably heard examples of personification, a useful literary device that adds color and meaning to your writing. Personification is a form of figurative language, where the writer attributes human characteristics to something that's not human. It's easiest for humans to relate to things that are human or have human traits. By using human characteristics to describe an object, animal, place, or occurrence in your writing, you can help the reader better relate to your writing. Let's do two quick exercises to practice identifying personification in writing. First, let's look at a poem by Emily Dickinson, who is famous even today for her personification of nature. She writes, Have you got a brook in your little heart where bashful flowers blow and blushing birds go down to drink and shadows tremble so? Emily Dickinson is writing about a person's heart, the hidden thoughts and shy desires that not everyone is keen to share. She does this by comparing the heart to a landscape and using three examples of personification, bashful flowers, blushing birds, and trembling shadows. We know that flowers don't have emotions and therefore are incapable of being bashful, but this imagery helps us imagine the drooping flowers and feel some kinship with them. The same goes for the blushing birds and trembling shadows. Personification is common in literature, but let's look at it in these famous lines from advertising to 
to make sure we can quickly recognize it in our everyday life. How about the Oreo cookie slogan? Oreo, milk's favorite cookie, or perhaps the slogan from Kleenex facial tissues. Kleenex says, bless you. Does milk have a mind or personality? Is it possible for milk to literally have a favorite? Not at all, but personification helps the customer feel closer to the product. Just as we know Kleenex doesn't possess the mind or ability to literally bless someone, but we can still feel comforted by this inanimate object because of the advertiser's clever use of personification. So when should you use personification in your own writing? It's the most appropriate in descriptive or narrative writing. As you saw in the earlier example, personification is often employed in poetry as well as creative fiction. It's rare to use personification in an essay or report, although a well-crafted example could help grab the reader's attention. It's important to remember that personification isn't just a way to be creative in your writing. It can add humor, point out truth, and invite the reader to deeper emotion. When John Milton wrote, Earth felt the wound and nature from her seat, sighing through all her works, gave signs of woe. He was not just describing Earth in a creative way. He was inviting you as a reader to think about the planet as a living thing. To understand what he was describing as the fall of man in the context of human physical suffering. It gives a reader pause. One last thing before we go. Sometimes personification is mixed up with another long word in literary analysis, anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is an extreme kind of personification in which animals or objects are described as if they were really people talking, walking upright, and thinking critically. This is stronger than simple personification, which could describe something with human terms without implying it had a consciousness. For example, if you read, the wolf accused the moon with his lonely howl, you might feel sympathy for the wolf, but you would hardly jump to the assumption that the wolf had human thoughts. Anthropomorphism, on the other hand, is something like Winnie the Pooh or the Geico Gecko. Here we see non-human animals and objects that literally walk and talk like humans. It's stronger than the personification and less subtle. I hope that this video was helpful. See you guys next time.